Today we are going to dive back into the book of Galatians. We've been in this sermon series, Truly Free, asking questions about uh, this letter that Paul wrote to the church at the time, uh, the church in Galatia, and he's trying to get across them in many different ways, what it means to be truly free in Christ. And today, the theme of the message is going to be roadblock, and you're going to kind of see that as it uh, is unpacked today as we read scripture and as we uh, look at some of the details. We'll be in Galatians chapter 3 if you want to start flipping and turning there if you brought a Bible with you. But what we'll see today is sort of a continued expansion of the points Paul has been making the last few times we've gotten together where Paul is contrasting the works of the law, right, which are the big ones like circumcision, dietary fellowship, and, and the Sabbath, but then also the minute details of the law, taking those and comparing, contrasting them with the idea of, of faith and the idea of grace, right? And so we pick it up in Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 10 and going through verse 14. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. By becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He, <coughs> excuse me, he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Probably all of us in this room at one time or another have been in a situation where we have faced a literal roadblock. We have been moving along in traffic, right? Traveling at the speed of the, that the highway will allow, maybe even interstate, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you go from traveling along at exactly the pace you want to go, and then you hit something that looks like this. Anybody been there? Anybody have the reliving the memories? Yeah, I see hands and heads shaking. I, I am a firm believer that situations like this are one of the great evidences that we still live in a broken world because, my goodness, when you're, when you're just cruising along and then you hit traffic like this and all you can see as far as you can see are those taillights lit up because nobody is going anywhere. Your first thought is usually, oh no, how long is this going to be? Your second thought most likely is, ah, do I have enough gas to get me through how long this is going to be? And then maybe eventually your third thought or fourth is, I wonder what is actually causing this problem to begin with, right? And most of the time, it's a road that's blocked because of a crash. Something has happened up ahead that was unexpected and unintended and potentially damaging, and therefore everything behind gets slowed down to a halt. Now, I will say that we live in a day and age, and it's a beautiful time to be alive, because if you have one of those beautiful devices called a smartphone, and you have an app like Google Maps, Google Maps now with live traffic updating can look ahead on the road for you and go, oh no, something's happening, and suggest an alternate route. Anybody had that experience? I had it like one or two times, and I just remember thinking, this is fantastic. My phone knows to tell my speakers to suggest to me that if I want to save 20 or 30 or 40 or 60 minutes of my life, I need to get off at this exit, drive 10 miles on this road, hop back on the highway, and I will miss the roadblock. Is there an easier decision in life than that? I don't know that there is. But we have faced these physical real roadblocks in life, and I would suggest to you that what Paul is talking about here is that the people of God are facing a spiritual roadblock. Paul has already talked with them in this letter about, listen, let's go back to Abraham, to the primacy of faith. Faith came before circumcisions and rituals. Faith came before the law. Faith came before all these things. And God's original intent, beginning with Abraham, we talked about last week, his original conversation with Abraham, I will bless you so that what? You can be a blessing to all nations. 
And Abraham believed and was credited to him as righteousness. So it's Abraham's job and the people of God, it's the job of them to take what they've received, both righteousness and blessing, and continue to flow with that and to bring it to all nations. That's why Paul's saying, listen, you Galatians, ignore these Judaizers. They want to take you backwards. Because essentially what Paul is getting at is this, the traffic flow of righteousness and blessing intended through Abraham has now met with a roadblock. And Paul would say that roadblock is the law itself. The law itself has caused the pileup. The law has caused the crash. It is responsible for the roadblock that began intended with Abraham and now the law has actually cut off the flow of God blessing and bringing righteousness to all nations. We might put it this way. God's people had transitioned from being transmitters of blessing to being guardians of boundaries. I want to say that again so we can all kind of grapple with the truth of that. What had happened over time is God's people had been charged with being transmitters of God's blessing, but in time they had been transformed into simply guardians of boundaries. They got so focused on, help me understand exactly the boundaries and the lines. I want to know them. I want to memorize them. I want to maintain them. I want to be able to explain them to others and hold others accountable to all of these boundaries that I have been given in the law. And because of that focus, that obsession, really, their calling, their original calling, the intent of God for them to transmit righteousness and blessing to all people has been short-circuited. It has been roadblocked. Because the people of God, instead of being like Abraham and starting with faith and using the law as just sort of guideposts, the law has become the foundation now. And because of that, it is a roadblock for the people. Paul uses four Old Testament quotes in this few verses we read this morning. If you have a Bible and you're following along, anybody notice how many of those extra little brackets are there? That's telling you that Paul, as a first century Jewish person, is using Old Testament scriptures to back up his point. And not just one, he's using four of them in this tiny little space. You know, why is he doing that? Why is he going back to the Old Testament? Well, it shouldn't surprise us. First of all, he's a former Pharisee. So Paul not only knew of the Old Testament, he probably had large sections of it memorized. So he's drawing on that well of knowledge. But think about this as well. What do you think the Judaizers in Galatia are doing to try and draw people away from grace and faith? You know what they're probably using? Scripture. Yeah, they're, they're, using, they're doing the same thing. So Paul is saying, I can show you using the same resources, a better way through the Old Testament promises. And what Paul's really doing is transforming a way of life that would have been understood generally in Judaism at the time. The phrase might have been used like this, obey and live. You'll find life in the commandments and the law. If you obey, you will live. But Paul's now saying, no, 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 believe and you will live. Exercise faith and who God is, and what God has done. It's not about obeying in order to have and find life. It's about believing and having faith in order to find and know and to have the life that God intends for you to have. He uses the phrase, and it's a quote from one of the prophets, that the righteous shall live by what? Rituals, right? No. Rules. No. Nope. The righteous will live by faith. And it's really important to note that. Because the prophets sort of come at the back end of the Old Testament, and I believe the prophets spoke at a time when they were seeing the age of the law having primacy dwindling. You know, they, they were looking at things, you know, going, you know, God says, I don't desire sacrifices, I don't desire obedience, those sorts of things. So they're, they're speaking about these things that really are, are laying the groundwork for what comes to its full fulfillment in Jesus Christ and in the Spirit, when a prophet is able to say the righteous are made righteous not by obedience, but instead by faith. And the way Paul describes it particularly in what we read today is he says uh, this idea of being cursed. Being cursed under the law or being cursed through or by the law. Something about the law has actually become a curse to the people. 
He quotes from Deuteronomy when he says, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Now, if you look up that reference and you look back in the context that Paul is using it, it's at the end of this section where the law is being given and, and defined and determined, and then there's some blessings given if you follow the law, but at the very end, there is a list of curses, and this is sort of the culminating curse. Those who cannot continue to live by everything written in the book of the law will be under a curse. Now, we read that word curse, and we need to make sure we're understanding it in a way that Scripture intends for it to be understood. And there are a lot of different ways to talk about this. I'm just going to describe or put forward a couple this morning. Here's one way to think about the law and the curse that goes along with it. Think about the law as if it's the speed limit. Right? Think about the law as if it's the speed limit. You know those signs that are posted with numbers that most of you ignore? Some of you, some of you ignore, right? Listen, I've talked to you. I've ridden with some of you. I know that those are merely considered very light suggestions on how you should engage the road, right? But think of the law like the speed limit. Here's what I mean by that. If you obey the speed limit, if you work within it, generally speaking, you will enjoy personal safety and integrity. You will enjoy community safety and integrity. And you will enjoy right relationship between yourself and your car, your car and the road, and all those other people that are driving around on it. The, the speed limit is given so that there is going to be good relationship between you and your vehicle, between you and all the other people trying to drive around on the road. The law was given so that good relationship would be maintained between people and God and between people and one another. However, let's just say for a moment that you think the speed limit, eh, just merely a suggestion, and let's say that you decide, I bet you I could probably go twice the speed limit and be fine. And imagine yourself driving around at over 100 miles an hour, disregarding the law completely, and you come upon a curve that is designed for you to go 55 miles per hour at maximum, and you're going over 100, what will happen? Wow. Wow. Unless you're a race car driver professionally, you are going to crash, spectacularly crash. And so what's going to happen is you are going to experience damage and hurt to yourself, to your car, to other people that might be sharing the road with you, and to any property that is nearby. And when we completely disregard the law... Okay? You put yourself at risk of danger and damage. You damage people around you. Right? All kinds of damage results from that. But then think about it this way. What if you decided, instead of saying, oh, the speed limit's not even really that important, what if it became the only thing you cared about when you're on the road? What if you thought the speed limit's the only thing that matters? And, and matter of fact, well, it's not even called the speed limit. I'm going to say that that number that's posted, that's exactly the number I need to be at right there the whole time. Can you imagine what your driving would look like if you were just constantly focused on maintaining an exact speed and obsessed with it? You'd just constantly be looking at your dashboard. You would miss stop signs. You would miss traffic lights. And guess what you're going to cause? Damage and accidents. The people of God had become so obsessed with the law and with keeping the tiny little itsy bitsy things that they had created a roadblock. They had created damage. So therefore, they're under this curse. Now, it's, again, it's easy for us to read the word curse and interpret it in a way that we have been culturally trained to do. We're, we're, it's, it's easy for us to misunderstand what's being communicated by a curse because we associate the word curse with maybe books that we've read or movies that we've seen, and we misunderstand it. We, we label it like it's some sort of creepy, cultish, uh, formulaic thing. If you're familiar with movie series like Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, if you're under the curse when you enter into the moonlight, then your skin is going to be, your bones will be revealed, and it's pirate gold that caused it, and it's all about blood and restoring these things. And, and we get into this mess of thinking that curses are these things that are so otherworldly and formulaic and just kind of creepy. But to be under a curse in the way Paul talks about it is much, much different, right? If you look at the idea of, of living under a curse in the Old Testament, and you look at the Old Testament as a whole, it means something much different. Because people who are living under a curse, the thing that they um, lost 
was a sense of community. In fact, the best way to understand all of the supernatural and spiritual realities of being someone who's cursed because of disobedience to the law can be boiled down best into something that actually happened in the history of God's people, and that is exile. It's when people lived in such a way that they so disregarded the law that God allowed them to be taken away by foreign powers to foreign lands. To live under exile would have been the ultimate manifestation that you were living as an accursed person or an accursed community, exiled outside of your own authority, of your own home. And in a sense, it matches up with what we understand of being a curse, because a curse, you know, there's, there's, there's suffering. It's going to hurt when you're living in an accursed state. But remember this. What is the original intent of God through Abraham, Paul keeps going back to? Engaging God in faith so that then you could be a blessing, where? To all nations. And so what happens when the people of God are under a curse and they are exiled, they end up being slaves, captives, and prisoners to some other nation and some other place. Therefore, they lose track of what they are originally supposed to be doing. Exile not only hurts them individually and personally, and it's the weight of their sin and their disobedience and their shame, but the exile is a sign that they are no longer able to carry on their God-given destiny. It's hard to be a blessing to all nations when you're being held captive in a particular nation, and not able to do the things you feel called to do. So take that concept of being cursed, of being exiled, right? Suffering in that way. And then fast forward to the times of Paul and the times of Jesus, and we're faced with this question. If we were going to have a manifestation of what it looked like to be under the curse in Paul's day or in Jesus' day, what would that look like? Well, first of all, you'd have to be under the boot of some sort of oppressor. Well, at the time of Jesus and Paul, the people of God once again find themselves under oppression. This time, though, it's not the Babylonians or the Assyrians, but who is it that's oppressing the Jewish people? It's the Romans. They're living under the Roman oppression. So what would it look like for a Jewish person in Jesus' day or Paul's day to deal with the fullest manifestation of being cursed, being exiled, living under an oppressed uh, system in which they were the people who are captives or slaves or being oppressed. What would it look like for a Jewish person in that day to be under a curse according to living under the Romans? It's easy. It would look like a cross. There is no better representation of the spiritual realities of cursedness in the day of Rome than hanging on a cross. That's why Paul connects it and says, you know, remember in the Old Testament, cursed is he who hangs upon a pole. Jesus essentially hung upon a pole with a cross beam. In that day, in that age, under Roman oppression, it was the cross that was the fullest extent. There was no other place more in exile than the cross of Jesus Christ. Not only is he taken outside of the city, not only is he hung there by his oppressors, but what does he mutter in some of the last breaths that he has? He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if we want to look at a place to best understand the the most cursed you could be in the days of Jesus and Paul, there is no other place than the cross. We need to only look there. Which is why Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us. Or we, we might put it this way today. Christ, with his perfect life and selfless death, took upon himself our lawlessness. Jesus was vindicated in his resurrection. He died a criminal's death. 
hanging out between criminals, hung up there by his oppressors, and yet his resurrection vindicates his cause, and the curse is removed. Paul says the curse of the law has been taken away. Because Jesus, who lived a perfect life and gave himself in a selfless death, was able to become cursed for us, to remove our cursedness. And so that cloud that hangs over each one of us because of the ways we have been disobedient to the law, right? No one can be justified by the law. Jesus is the only one in keeping with all of the law, and by doing so, he becomes the one who can take our lawlessness onto himself and offer us freedom from the curse. But the thing is, it's not just about us as individuals. If we go back to the theme of the roadblock, what happens if Jesus removes the curse of the law? What happens if you're stuck in traffic and all you see for miles are red lights and somebody finally removes that which was blocking the road? Well, then that traffic can finally start to flow again. When Jesus Christ removed the roadblock through the cross and through the resurrection, he allowed, rewinding back to Abraham, for that initial purpose of God to begin flowing once again, to bring righteousness and freedom and justice to all nations. It's almost as if there was a reboot that happened. You familiar with that? idea, the terminology, to reboot a computer or to restart a phone or do something like that, to sort of go back to the beginning. And that's what Jesus enables God's people to do. And if Jesus, through the cross and the resurrection, has sort of rebooted us back to the, the primacy of faith that started with Abraham, the question that we're sort of left with is what comes next? Because if you go back to Abraham and you say, yes, Abraham was justified by his faith, well, what comes next in his story? Well, pretty soon the rite of circumcision, and sometime after that the law. And so the expectation might be if Jesus reboots everything back to having faith, what comes next? Is there going to be a new rite, a new ritual? Is there going to be a new set of rules? And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, I, I, I believe that uh, for whatever reason, church history and even church today is littered with our desire for those things. We get, we get rebooted back to faith in Christ and we start going, okay, what can I do? What rituals can I do? What rules can I follow? It's as if we want a new law. Jesus decided he was going to die in order to free us from the curse of the old law. And the first thing we want a lot of times, give me a new law. Give me new rituals. Give me new rules. I need to follow those. But what does that tiny band of early disciples, the people of God, what did they receive? Did they receive a new law? No. Did they receive a new ritual? No. What did they receive in an upper room? The Spirit. And Paul talks about it, the very end of what we read today so that you might receive the Spirit. But man, a new law would be so much easier. <laughs> Just give me, give me a few things I need to do. Give me a few rules I need to follow. But you know where that takes us back to? It takes us back to the law all over again. And said, the people of God, the church receives the Spirit. Th think about it this way. After they receive the Spirit, on Pentecost, what's one of the first things the Spirit enables them to do? Almost immediately. The fire and everything, right? You're tracking. They use their mouth. What are they able to do? Speak in different languages. And th listen, this is not for show. This is not for demonstration. It goes back to the same idea. Because if you are now the people who have been rebooted back to faith in order to bless all nations, guess what it helps be able to do? Speak in different languages. This is a sign that things have been rebooted back and God is on a pathway. His intention is going to be fulfilled once again. And it's not just the words that they spoke. If you read the book of Acts, there's a new directionality to it. Because where does it begin? In Jerusalem. But does it stay there? No. The entire book of Acts is moving outward. By the leading of the Spirit and by the persecution that happened to them, I mean, they could have hunkered down and said, we're just going to wait it out, but they didn't. The Spirit and the persecution led them outward. 
which is great because, you know, it's Jesus saying, you're going to go here to Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Why? To continue to bring righteousness and blessing to all people. And that's what happens in Acts. They keep pushing further and further out. Some traditions believe that some of those first disciples went as far as like India. Why? Because God's initial plan is back on track. That roadblock that was messing up the works has been removed. And now God can continue with his intention. So does it start to make sense now that Paul would be so adamant about what he's trying to tell these people in Galatia, right? Because if they have received the Spirit, you know, we talked last week, why do you start with the Spirit and go back to the flesh? Why do you start with grace and go back to the law? It's not even a new law. They're trying to drag you back to the old law, and we already know that didn't work. That's why he's so adamant saying, this is about faith exercising faith because the curse of the law and the entire old system that it brought with it has been lifted in Jesus Christ. So just a few things to think about and engage with as we finish, because we don't just want to listen and read the word, we want to respond as well. Here's the first thing to consider and reflect on. Are you more interested in guarding your boundaries or transmitting God's blessing? We talked at the beginning about how the people of God went from being those who transmit the blessing of God to people who just kept track of where the boundaries were. Secondly, do you tend to find comfort, fulfillment, or even pride in knowing and keeping the rules? This is sort of a personality thing. Some people really love to know and keep the rules. There's a certain value in that. That's not always a bad thing. It leads to some good compliant behavior. But if that attitude spills over into our spiritual formation, it's going to be detrimental. Next, have you surrendered to the cross of Christ in order to remove the curse of your shortfalls and your failures? Essentially, do you understand the gospel today? Have you allowed the gospel to penetrate your life and surrender to Jesus knowing that all of your shortfalls, mistakes, and failures have been removed? The curse of disobedience has been removed from us. And lastly, where is the Spirit carrying you to engage God's desire to bring blessing to all people? Because the, the, the motion of God's intent is still outward. And I'm convinced, friends, that he's not done. Jesus has not returned yet, so the mission is not over. And God is not sending someone else. He's sending you. Where is the Spirit carrying you so that you can continue to bring God's righteousness and blessing to the world around you? So take a moment or two to think, to pray, to reflect, and then I'm going to close us in prayer in uh, just a moment, and then we're going to sing one more song together before we conclude our time.